Welcome to another exciting edition of TV Set coming to you. <laughs> We're trying to pump up the volume here. here. Right, Sally? Right. We're pumping it up. <laughs> so my name is Jim Rathall, and my uh, guest host, Sally Steeppath, is to my, my left. And uh, we also have John Kellerman, an old friend of mine who is a songwriter. Uh, he writes good songs and a programmer. He, he does good programming, and, uh, he, he, and he talks good, too. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, also my, my, uh, my stalwart co-host and, um, and assistant uh, uh, production editor, uh, crash and burn kind of. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've had a tri very trying Train week. Time, yes. <laughs> Uh, Jeff Gerritsen is, is with Thank me you. also. So the, the topic for today's show is going to be uh, debt and uh, the nature of debt, how, how, uh, how it affects us, how it, how it uh, plays out in our lives. And uh, we will be uh, working with a book we have right here uh, that I, I came across. It's called Debt, the, the, uh, the First 5,000 Years uh, by a guy named David, David Graeber. And who turns out to be a more interesting person the more I dig into uh, information about him and what he's been doing. So, um, uh, and so um, uh, we, um, we've all, almost all have, have read a, a, uh, an essay uh, called Debt the First 5,000 Years that is the same name as, as uh, the book, Debt the First 5,000 Years. Uh, which was written about four years before the book. And so it, it was really kind of the, the, the seminal ideas that, that later got developed in, into the book. So we've all taken a look at that. Sally, unfortunately, there was a communications uh, snafu, and uh, so Sally um, read it really quickly <laughs> just before the show. <laughs> but um, <coughs> I'm sure that uh, I'm sure we'll do fine here. So, um, uh, but to start off, uh, uh, we have a, a short clip um, that we're going to uh, show you. By the way, John also has written a song, a special for the show, that he's going to perform for us tonight. But the first clip was a clip that I found on uh, Charlie Rose, uh, where, um, where um, uh, David Graeber is talking to Charlie Rose. Charlie is, is kind of a, uh, is kind of a, um, a, uh, a, a guy that, that believes in the status quo at all at all costs, and that uh, he hasn't met a war he has he doesn't like, uh, he he hasn't met a a a a, a, a deep uh, systemic change that uh, that he likes at all. And so here he is interviewing. Uh, this is a, a clip from the interview interviewing David Graeber, one of the world's um, uh, uh, an up and coming figure in the world of anthropology. And, and recognized all over the world, and also an anarchist. He's a red diaper baby. We'll explain to you what that means. So if we can go to, uh, to clip number one, that would just be... Is globalization uh, a bad idea? No, no, I think globalization... I think most anarchists are much more in favor of globalization than the people that they oppose. Then, then I'm sorry? Than the people that they oppose. I don't think the IMF, the World Bank, are particularly in favor of globalization in any meaningful sense of the term. Yeah. If you think that... Globalization is the effacement of borders and the free movement of people, possessions, and ideas. Let's define it that way. Well, good idea. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, but I mean, of course, anarchists are opposed to the very existence of international borders because we don't believe in nation states. Uh, at the same time, you know, if you look at what actually happens with globalization, first of all, free movement of people. It's not what it's about at all. I mean, the, num the border guard between U.S. and Mexico has tripled since the signing of NAFTA. And because the way what they call globalization actually works, it's all about trapping people in places where you then remove social security, right. um, creating people desperate enough to undersell each other, and allow corporations to move around to take advantage of it. I mean, I, we don't think that's real globalization. All right, so that was uh, David Graeber uh, and talking to Charlie Rose. And if you've just uh, joined the show, uh, the, the topic of tonight's show is going to be debt. Um, and, um, and, and we're going to be discussing some of the ideas of David Graeber and also some of the ideas of our own, of course, having to do with debt and uh, what this might mean for our future. Um, but before we get going too far, uh, one of our guests, John Kellerman, uh, songwriter um, par excellence, 
he, he, he gave a confident shrug on that one, is going to uh, sing a song that he wrote for our show. Actually, I wrote this song some time ago. I changed the chorus for the occasion. They say, them that's got is them that get. The odds are in their favor every time they bet. They've got the gold, so they make the rules. We wonder why we lose their game and feel like fools. They tell us that we have to do what they say is best. They maximize their profits and disregard the rest. We pay our dues, they gain what we lose. We hardly ever think about what we could choose. What is money but a way to represent a debt? Debts that can't be paid, you might as well forget. No more owing, everybody free. That's what we call a jubilee. Our money has no value but for common consent. We take it on faith or else it couldn't be spent. It's used as a key to things that we need, but it's only made of paper and it ain't guaranteed. Our monetary system is based on debt. It grows to pay the interest. How big can it get? It can't keep growing and never stop. It's nothing but a bubble, so it's bound to pop. What is money but a way to represent a debt? Debts that can't be paid, you might as well forget. No more owing, everybody free, that's what we call a jubilee. Well, it's hard to get money and it's easily spent when you're working by the hour paying taxes and rent. We support the wealthy and the military state when we trade our time for paychecks doing jobs we hate. Do a favor for a neighbor, what's that cost? I don't mind working, but I hate to be bossed. I'll give to you as you give to me. We'll do what we want when our time is free. What is money but a way to represent a debt? Debts that can't be paid, you might as well forget. No more owing, everybody free, that's what we call a jubilee. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to revise that and say this song was not written especially for the show. It was written partially for the show. <laughs> <because> <laughs> I believe he did revise some parts of it for the show tonight. Thank you very much, John. Love the song. Um, and it also uh, captures a lot of the, of the things that we're going to be discussing. And um, uh, one of the things that really got me to, uh, to focus on debt was, <coughs> well, partly... My son has accrued uh, a substantial amount of, uh, of school debt. Um, when Occupy Portland was going on, I was down there uh, shooting some video. And I talked to a lot of, a lot of uh, younger folks that um, were staggering under, under school debt. In fact, I interviewed about 50 different people. Mm -hmm. And hmm. the most common complaint, and these were video interviews, the most common complaint was uh, for these young people was staggering under school debt because they had done what they'd been told they were supposed to do. They'd gone to college, they'd gotten their education, they were prepared for the future, only there were no jobs and they were under a, a debt that had been made unforgivable. Unforgivable. <laughs> You study 16 years and what do you get? Another year older and deeper in debt. St. Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul in student loans. Yes, that's, that's, where, my, that's where my son is at right now. He's, he's, it's, uh, it's, it's, really, uh, it's really something. 
It used to be the company store. Now yeah. it's student loans. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Same. Same. Uh, same. Uh, same. Same principle. principle. It was the <laughs> same kind of well, a I mean, time. You know, the company store would sell you your tools before you could even start working. You know. Right. Yeah. And, and then, then there was the company housing, and mm -hmm. you know. Interesting. It's and the same yeah. playbook. And you same were paid in playbook. company script. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So right. you couldn't go outside and spend that money anywhere else. You're you captive. Money. You're captive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Um, so, uh, and there's another angle on this whole thing too. Uh, <coughs> Jeff and I uh, have been been discussing this particular one for several years now, and that has to do with with peak oil, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and there was a, was an organization here uh, in town called Portland Peak Oil. I think it's pretty much dissolved now. But I was talking to my daughter, by the way, just yesterday, and I found out one really great thing that happened because of Portland Peak Oil. She and her boyfriend fell in love at a peak oil meeting. That's good. <laughs> and they're Combustion. Now, they're now married, uh, <laughs> been, been together for seven years. They have a, a lovely, lovely child. And so peak oil was at least good for that. But what peak oil means is that, is that we have been exper experiencing an ever expanding and essentially cheapening, you know, le less expensive, cheaper s uh, source of global energy. And peak oil means that there is going to come a place where the it doesn't keep expanding anymore. It's in fact it levels off, and then the world supply will go into a, a, a decline. I, I thought left we out were the over verse about peak. Uh, <laughs> go ahead peak one oil. at a time. <laughs> go ahead. I left out the verse about peak oil. It goes like. Uh, <laughs> Uh, our economy is fueled by petroleum. The oil supply is declining, so that's pretty dumb. We need a way of life that this planet can sustain. We're going to lose it all if we don't use our brain. That's yeah, true. That's awful true. Sally, what were you going to say? I thought peak oil, that we're already to the peak. Well, yes. And past it, in fact. Except now there's tar sands oil. Well, well, tar yeah. sands oil takes a lot of energy to Exactly, produce. exactly. And that's how they've managed to extend the peak. Yeah. By more and more destructive extraction yeah. processes. So, so the, the, uh, Sally, you're right, the conventional oil, which is like yes. dig a hole in the ground, pump it out, that's conventional oil. The, the conventional oil has, has actually gone into decline mm -hmm. globally, and, uh, but they've been supplementing that with, so with what they call natural gas liquids that they didn't used to consider. Uh, to mix it in, but heavy, uh, heavy crude, heavy crude, and heavy deep, crude. deep uh, wells. Yes. Yeah. Well, in, in the whole term of peak oil and when, when oil was going to peak has been the mud, water's been muddied really bad, because now you have conventional liquids, you have the unconventional liquids, you have um, the new stuff now, the tar sands, which are they're lumping them under unconventional, but it's in essence everything we're coming along that's new is yielding a, a lower net energy return, which is even exacerbating the problem. But the first problem is, is we have this little icky thing called capitalism that needs continuous growth. And if you don't have continuous growth in your energy, energy supply, capitalism can't grow. And so now we have all this running, we're running to find all these other uh, diminishing returns. It's resources. like that stack of plates that's tipping over it's and tipping you have to over. Run faster. 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 Exactly. And the point is, we're past all the really cheap oil. That's right. right. Can and because we're past the cheap oil, there, it, there's not as much profit. Exactly. Yeah. And the profit it's margin. So, what's, what's the name of the politician that keeps saying we need to adjust our for a no growth uh, scenario? Is there a politician that says Yes, that? there is. The is Bernie, there? Is it Bernie Sanders? I think so. Bernie Sanders, does I he, think, has been say saying that. that. Well, there, there is one. Well, yeah, he, he calls himself a democratic socialist. Good, good. So we have one. One have out one. of what? A total of uh, 600, I suppose? Oh, 435 plus Something like that, 100, yes. So yeah. uh -huh. 535. Well, 535. might have said that, but uh, yeah. he got uh, gerrymandered out of office. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. So anyway, mm -hmm. uh, what, this, what this means for us is we have had a big, cheap pie. And now the pie is starting to shrink, mm -hmm. you know, and not only in this country, but globally. The, the pie is starting to get, get smaller, <laughs> and so the pieces are starting to shrink. And so what's going to happen? Well, right now we see that bankers are, you know, are, are having boom years right now. Mm -hmm. But we're seeing that there are other... Here uh, in the States. 
All over the world. All over the world. Well, Iceland, from what I understand, they're, Iceland they're, they're able to, to put some it? of those bankers in into prison. Well, that's, wow, that's good. It, it's about time. About time. Did, can, can, if, uh, for another show, would you want to work? We should, yeah. Yes. You want to work that one yeah, up? Yeah, I think we should work that, that one up. Because would, be we haven't put a banker in prison since the 80s when we the haven't. SNL crisis yeah. hit. Two no, exactly. jail. It's about time. It's about, about time. time. So, um, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a member of an of a email discussion list. Uh, it's called Transition Portland. And I've been watching some of the discussions that have been on there. And there are some people uh, on this discussion list that feel that it's going to be a much better world after peak oil, when, when the, you know, the global energy supply begins to, uh, to become less because uh, we will be able to go back to a, um, a, a more peaceful uh, uh, kind of pastoral kind of existence mm -hmm. or something like that. That would be wonderful if it would work that way. But I'm I'm not seeing that. I'm I'm beginning. To, I don't know. Let's hear from you guys. What what do you think about that sort of thing? Well, number one, capitalism doesn't run in reverse. Yeah. It's okay. A, now, why why do you say that? Because capitalism needs continuous growth. Mm -hmm. It either grows or it collapses. Like a shark. I mean, it just that's the way it is. Uh, number two, our history is replete with societies, empires that collapse and fade from view. And their trek down the downslope has not been pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Roman Empire, we have the uh, Easter Island, the Polynesians, mm -hmm. um, the Ottoman Empire that, that collapsed, uh, the uh, Vikings, the Vikings and Greenland. Greenland, I mean, Britain, Britain, the British Empire, um, it goes on and on. And in each one, the people had to gr grapple with that shrinking pie. And at first, they tried to prop it up and keep it going through injections of debt. Mm -hmm. So they didn't actually go directly to a bucolic, uh, pastoral existence. More like a bubonic. <laughs> <laughs> good one. That's, that's a good one. <laughs> there's, a, there's a book uh, called Collapse by Jared mm -hmm. Diamond, mm -hmm. the guy who wrote uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and he takes a chapter for uh, various societies through history that have collapsed because of resource mm -hmm. depletion, yes. invasion, various other factors. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about well, his analysis is that he shows the difference between societies that collapsed uh, and with many people perishing or starving to death and ones that managed to survive was their decision-making process. Mm -hmm. If they could make a rational decision to do the right thing to survive, then they would survive. Mm -hmm. But it's like in in Easter Island, where they cut down the uh, the trees to to roll these stupid heads around, uh, and then they didn't have wood to build boats to go out and get fish, and they starved. You yes. know, um, it, the the chiefs were com competing for status. Mm -hmm. You know, so there was there was nobody. Uh, and 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 um, sadly, he says we're we're um, we're in a similar situation. So there was nobody country. who had their eyes on real need, uh, right. foodstuffs and things. Yeah, well, they, they you know, uh, you might ask, you know, who was the person who cut down the last tree on Easter Island? Well, you know, it happened over generations, and the trees got smaller and smaller, and pretty soon they forgot what they were for, you know. Okay. Um, I'm kind of the yes. timekeeper yes. of the time show keeper. kind of guy. Uh, so, uh, control room, I believe that we're going to... Uh, uh, get rid of uh, Roland's number uh, two and three, and our next Roland is going to be number four. So uh, if, give me a thumbs up when you're prepared for that. So um, I um, this comes back to debt. I mean, I, I, t I take a look at, at my son, and I mean, I, the, you know, there are homeless camps all over the country. You know, there's uh, mm -hmm. and I met I met lots of, of college uh, age kids who are done with college or ready to go out in the working force and they are just uh, desperate for finding some some kind of employment and so it, it's not a real pretty picture david graber however uh was um is uh one of the organizers of occupy wall street and um uh, on another show i'd like to go a little bit deeper in, into his work because i think it's really really fascinating who he is and and what he's trying to do uh that that clip that we saw earlier was him on Charlie Rose's show. So there's Charlie interviewing 
just an anarchist, right? <laughs> About a year later, he's interviewing David Graeber, who was the organizer of Occupy Wall Street. It's a very different interview. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Okay, so um, uh, do we have a thumbs up on number four? Yes. Okay. So let's go into uh, uh, Roland number four, and this is Jeffrey Smith, uh, a local guy. He's he's um, he's not a professional economist, but he is uh, more of an economist than anybody that I know. He had a piece that was published in uh, Truthout and at the Truthout website, and so I went over, dropped by his house, and uh, and so I got a uh, I shot some video of him discussing his his article. If we could go to Roland number four, it'd be wonderful. Um, recently, I used the phrase Black Friday, uh, re referring to its original definition, and the person I was talking to was young enough to not know that the term Black Friday had two definitions. The, the younger person only knew Black Friday as the day after Thanksgiving, the, the shopping frenzy that keeps many retailers in the black for the entire year through their sales on that one day after Thanksgiving. They did not know that originally in business, Black Friday referred to a stock market crash. And Black Monday referred to a stock market crash. And Black Thursday, same thing. Black Monday referred to the biggest crash in US history, 1987. And um, the others referred to the Great Depression of the 1920s. And it, it just struck me how not just how words and phrases change over time. Some of that change is from the bottom up, like how today everybody says like. That's a bottom up change. And, and some changes are top down. For instance, Black Friday. That's not a, a popular conception that's sort of imposed by the media and the commentators and, and so forth. But we have lost the original definition and so we've lost a bit of, a, of our history and a bit of caution towards economic events such as depressions and recessions and whatnot. And we, what we're left with is this notion that a stock market collapse can cause a depression or recession. Yet recently, even in the business, business press, Bloomberg, there was an article that showed it was not the stock market that, when it crashed, created the depression or recession, but actually the housing bubble popping created it. And this gets into the topic of debt because it isn't housing exactly. More precisely, it is what the house sits on, and that's land. Buildings get old and wear out and lose value, but locations grow in value as more people move in, technology advances and so forth. Um, and it's not a steady incline, it's a uh, cycle. It goes up and down, up and down, but uh, mainly up. And then there's a bubble that bursts and there's a crash. But what creates that bubble is speculating in land and what creates that speculation is what they call leverage, which is borrowing to bet. So if you look at it, the biggest part of debt, of private debt, of um, bank loans, is um, to, uh, to individuals, is uh, mortgages. And the biggest part of the mortgage is for the land or the location. And what is especially crucial about people spending money for land is that it never, ever rewards labor or capital because land was not created by labor or capital. When you spend money on your sneakers or a computer or a car or whatever, you reward labor and capital and the people who made it are gonna make more and the economy is gonna keep cycling around. But when you buy land, it does not reward anybody's effort. And so as the price of land goes up, you spend more money not rewarding anybody's effort and less money on rewarding people's uh, labor and capital. So it, 
at some point, land will absorb all the uh, discretionary and purchasing power of people and recession results. Um, the economists who acknowledge this are not the ones winning Nobel Prizes. They um, are not refuted by their brethren. They're, they're more or less overlooked and ignored. But you can't, you can't escape how critical it is, uh, the role of land and, and its ability to absorb um, social progress, economic progress, and so forth, how it creates recession, how it creates debt, and um, how it actually also keeps people impoverished and when they can't have access to prime land to, do, to uh, conduct their business. And if you look in a city like uh, Portland, you see enormous number of vacant lots. And what those lots represent is um, unemployment, for instance. That, that lot could have a store employing people. OK, that was Jeffrey Smith, a, a, a local Portland guy. And uh, he has a. Um, an organ, or he's part of an organization that he calls Geonomics, and uh, the, the the idea is that they are trying to change the way uh, the, the 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 base of taxation away from buildings and and toward land value rather than building value. So uh, some interesting ideas there. Any thoughts hmm. on anything you heard there? Well, I think taxing land is part of the solution. I don't think it's the to the whole solution. But I think we need to look at all these uh, solutions in a constellation of options. Yeah, and yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know that taxing land is going to offset diminishing returns. It won't. Or diminishing resources. <laughs> the, the, the big problem they don't realize is, and most economists think that the economies run on money, they don't, they run on energy. And that's the problem we have. Yeah, there's a <coughs> economist, David Corton, who used mm -hmm. to work for. Uh, USAID or some one of those uh, international aid agencies, and he distinguishes between real wealth and phantom wealth. Mm -hmm. oh. And the, the, you know, when the phantom wealth expands, it just means everyone's share of real wealth is diluted. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I was reading through mm. um, <sighs> Graeber's uh, essay here when he talks about. Um, debt as a way of subjugating a population. Mm -hmm. And um, I found it interesting that in a sense, and, and moving on into this, I found it interesting that uh, kings would use debt to subject people because they found it easier to uh, encourage markets and then that way they could buy whatever they needed from the markets. And at the same time with a coinage money, they could also pay off their um, soldiers. soldiers. Mm -hmm. And then they could... Uh, so Confessions of an economic hitman. Hit man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so then, using that logic, if they're enslaving Jim's kids, mm -hmm. right, and, right, and my well, son, they find a job for him. The kids who have just gone through college. My daughter-in-law, same thing. Right. Mm -hmm. But what benefit is that? What do they get from enslaving? I don't, I don't think it's the king itself gets... people under debt. The, the the government itself doesn't get the benefit. It's the financial institution that hasn't been enslaved gets the benefit. What's the benefit? They have these assets. They have they have a guaranteed asset that can never be forgiven. No. Yeah. This is this is the same thing as your life being owned. This is the same thing as mm -hmm. you were permanently indebted for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. This would be the same thing as uh, being on a, a slave on a plantation. You own the means of production. You own the the place where the people live. They have to pay you rent. You know, you're mm -hmm. essentially a noble. John, your your song uh, used the word jubilee, and <coughs> perhaps not everybody that was listening to it caught the uh, the reference. And I was wondering if you could explain that. Well, <coughs> that's uh, mentioned in the uh, Cliff Notes version of this book, um, which uh, I found on Wikipedia, um, but. The idea of a jubilee is um, to forgive debts once they become unsustainable to avoid a revolution. And it's been done many times in, in ancient history uh, because basically, you know, debt is sort of an engine, if you will, of, of uh, 
an economic engine. People mm -hmm. are motivated to work in order to pay off their debts, but once they can't pay off their debts, like what's happening in Europe, uh, they riot. You know, there's a general mm -hmm. strike. You know, the the uh, the, the Greeks uh, don't want to take it anymore. Mm -hmm. And and in we're, Iceland, we're in this country. We are really not hearing what's really going on over there. Not, yeah. Not not to the extent that it's it's actually. And we're not happening. hearing much about Iceland, who reneged on their debts and seem to be doing just fine. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> they uh, com relatively. Well, the government bought out the people whose debts went bad. Mm -hmm and put the bankers in jail, which is the mm -hmm. opposite of what we've done. Yeah, we put the people in jail and rewarded the bankers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the, the other thing about Jubilee um, in forgiving their debt, uh, and especially in those cultures, uh, there was no limits on how far you could go into debt and how far the uh, debt or would take control of the debt eve. Like, for example, um, well, I'm reading here from Graper's essay. It says, uh, at first they may come and remove his, uh, his sheep or his livestock, um, his furniture, then his house, his fields, his orchard, his ways of making um, a living, his wife, his children, even himself, they go into debtor's prison. So they found that when it got to that level in these societies, that became extremely destruct destructive and disruptive. Mm -hmm. And the rioting, um, because they were faced with roving bands of landless, homeless, homeless desperate, desperate people. people. <laughs> Who had nothing to lose. Nothing to lose. And let's nothing hope, to lose. Let's, yeah, let's, let's hope we don't go that far. Yeah. So do I. So well, there are uh, homeless, landless, desperate people, but they haven't organized into uh, militias yet. That was, you mm -hmm. said yet at the end yes. of your sentence, right? Yes. Right. I guess you know I've often commented in uh, forums and blogs that uh, my concern going in the future is there is a French Revolution style of reaction or revolt, mm -hmm. and it has the potential to become even more violent a reaction than the French Revolution. Part of me says, "Yay, the perpetrator is going to get their just just desserts." The other part of me goes, "Oh my God, do you know what that means? That's the negative term of anarchy. That's the." Uh, that's chaos, mm -hmm. and that's when despots come to arise or come to power. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Uh, to lighten things up, just a skosh. <laughs> a skosh. Um, we have Roland number five, which uh, um, is done. Uh, was done by the, the the person that put together a, an animation called The Story of Stuff. Oh yeah. And oh, that. cool. And this is called The Story of Broke. Broke. <laughs> broke. <laughs> mm. Okay. That's me. No? What okay. real broke looks like, huh? <laughs> well, there's more to that. O yeah. Okay, control room. <coughs> let's let's uh, let her rip. In season one of the story of stuff, we looked at a system that creates way too much stuff and way too little of what we really want. Now we're going to start looking at the stories behind the story of stuff. That's where we'll find ways to turn this situation around. Welcome to season two. These last few years, I've had to get a lot more careful about how I spend my paycheck. Everyone has. Like I'm eating out less often, holding back on expenses I don't really need, and saving for my kids' college. I'm getting more responsible, taking control of how I spend. But one thing I can't control is that every month a big chunk of my paycheck goes off to our government. It's not the most fun part of my budget, but I believe in paying taxes. Not just because it's the law, but because it's how I invest in the better future that I can't afford to build on my own. You know, that future that we all want, and nearly every candidate promises us. Great schools, a healthy environment, clean energy, good jobs. But a funny thing happens to our money on its way to that better future. It seems to disappear. And by the time we get around to investing in that future, all I hear is, sorry, not this year, we're broke. In fact, we're so broke, they say, that we have no choice but to slide backwards, cutting things that made this country great, like schools and the EPA maybe even Social Security and Medicare. Wait a minute, broke? I'm sending in my fair share of hard-earned cash every month, and so are you. If everyone did, we'd have plenty of money. 
Now, what we've got to work with shrinks a lot thanks to corporate tax loopholes and unprecedented tax breaks for the richest 1%. But even after those, we've still got over a trillion dollars. So if we're broke, what's happening to all that money? I decided to look into it, and it turns out this whole broke story hides a much bigger story. A story of some really dumb choices being made for us. Choices that actually work against us. The good news is that these are choices, and we can make different ones. So where is all that money going? Well, first the military takes the biggest chunk. $726 billion in 2011. Wow, we could build a lot of better future with that kind of money. Spending billions on fighter planes that we don't need, or wars with no end, and then saying we're broke, just isn't honest. It's like calling your kid from your billion dollar yacht to tell her you can't afford her school lunch money. Then hundreds of billions more go to propping up the dinosaur economy. You know, the obsolete system we talked about in the story of stuff. The one that produces more pollution, greenhouse gases and garbage than any other on Earth, and doesn't even make us happy. In so many ways, it's just not working. But we're keeping it on life support instead of building something better. A lot of that life support comes in the form of subsidies. A subsidy is a giveaway that gives some companies a lift over others. That's not necessarily a bad thing. We should help companies that are building a better future. The problem is our government keeps lifting up companies that are actually dragging us down. Everywhere you look along the dinosaur economy, you'll find these subsidies. There's spending subsidies, where the government just gives our money away, like payments that benefit big agribusiness while helping drive family farms off a cliff. Or the less obvious version, where the government foots the bill for things corporations should pay for themselves, like cleaning up toxic chemical spills or giant livestock manure ponds. Or building roads that only go to one place, like a new Walmart. Or paying for polluting and wasteful garbage incinerators that would never make financial sense to build on their own. Then there's tax subsidies, which excuse big corporations from contributing their fair share, like the enormous tax breaks granted to oil and gas companies, even in times of record profits. These subsidies amount to billions we should be collecting and putting to good use. And then there's risk transfer subsidies, where our government acts as an investment bank or an insurance company for corporations doing risky things, like building nuclear reactors. If anything goes wrong, we have to cover for them. There's freebie subsidies, where our government gives stuff that belongs to all of us to corporations for cheap or even free. That's billions more that we should be collecting but never see, like permits to mine public lands granted at prices set in the mining law of 1872. Really, 1872. President Grant signed this law to encourage settlement of the West. Newsflash, it's settled. Hmm? And all this doesn't even count externalized costs. They don't show up on any spreadsheet and could amount to trillions of dollars, including all of the damage to the environment, public health, and the climate that this dinosaur economy causes. Without laws that make these polluters pay, we all pay with the loss of clean air and water, of increased asthma and cancer. By the time we've handed out all of these subsidies, there isn't even enough money to pay our bills. Forget about building the better future. So why is there always enough money for the dinosaur economy, from big oil to bailouts for big banks? But when it comes to building a better future, we're supposedly broke. Maybe it's because these guys know how to ask for it. Their lobbyists and giant campaign contributions let our government know what they want and what they'll do if they don't get it. And it works. U.S. senators who voted to keep big oil subsidies in 2011 had received five times more in big oil campaign cash than those who voted to end them. So, while subsidies should be a tool to help companies that are helping us all, they've become a prize for those with the most power to get on the handout list. But you know who has the real power? We do. What if we got as protective of our tax dollars as we are with the rest of our money? What if we told our government what we want and what we'll do if we don't get it, starting with voting them out? We could redirect these dinosaur subsidies, freeing up hundreds of billions of dollars. Forget broke, we could start building a better future right now. We could begin by reinvesting the $10 billion that we spend on oil and gas subsidies into renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. With just half of that amount, we could provide solar energy to about 2 million households. Then use the rest to retrofit half a million homes, creating jobs and saving energy year after year. The average cost of cleaning up a toxic Superfund site is $140 million. 
Let's make the polluters pay and instead invest our money in developing safer materials so we don't have to worry about spills in the first place. Most chemicals today are made from oil. That's why they're called petrochemicals. Switching just 20% of them to safer bio-based materials would create over 100,000 new jobs. And instead of subsidizing garbage incinerators, let's subsidize real solutions like zero waste. Raising the U.S. recycling rate to 75% would result in one and a half million new jobs with less pollution, less waste, and less pressure to harvest and mine new stuff. What's not to like? That would still leave billions of dollars for improving education, the best investment for a healthy economy. With $100 billion, we could increase the number of elementary school teachers by over 40% and give college scholarships to over 6 million students. See, we can rebuild the American dream. We can afford to have a healthy environment, good jobs, and top-notch public education. But not if we continue subsidizing the dinosaur economy. So the next time you have an idea for a better future and someone tells you, that's nice, but there's no money for that, you tell them we are not broke. There is money. It's ours, and it's time to invest it right. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we've been discussing debt this evening, um, and uh, you're watching TV set. My name's Jim Rathall. This is Jeff Gerritsen, my guest, uh, John Kellerman, and my, my co-host, uh, Sally Steeppath. Um, we, um, uh, Jeff, um, <coughs> uh, you and I had a phone conversation earlier today, and we were discussing the, the, the paper here that we're talking about. And uh, there was something that you said about, uh, about debt, about you'd only thought about it one way before, and I was wondering if you'd share that with us. Well, Graber brings up two, two points of view on debt. And I've always thought of debt in the negative sense, the traditional view. You know, debt is to be avoided, um, be minimized, use it sparingly because it carries interest, uh, connotation of having to pay back a debt with interest. Uh, like a credit card debt, sometimes it can be as high as 30%. Um, but Graeber brings up the point of there's the debt we are indebted to each other for providing that uh, nurturing environment we live in. There's indebtedness we have to our community leaders who give us, uh, provide a society where we can live. Uh, the good leaders. The good leaders, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we've got to make that distinction now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, schools, your school mm -hmm. teacher. Um, the good teachers. The good teachers, yeah. <laughs> okay. you're, some of your good college professors. Yes. Um, Great ones, yes. And, and so forth. Uh, the, the people who construct these structures, these societal structures, the infrastructure of life, so to speak. Uh, we, we owe a debt to them. Mm -hmm. you know, we owe a debt to the, uh, parents. the idea that nobody got rich on their own. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. right. I, yeah, we didn't do this all by ourselves. Like, where did you get the? the. Where did you get the? <laughs> the word T-H-E. Where did it come <laughs> from? <laughs> Usually you and me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but, and it really, it opened up my whole eyes and thoughts to this concept that not all debt is bad. Mm -hmm. And even if you go back into some uh, more ancient times, um, let's say a banker, well, what we would call a banker today would loan a the farmer. Mo money lender. The money lender mm -hmm. that would loan somebody the money to plant a crop. Mm -hmm. Well, he would be paid back in kind, mm -hmm. and y usually little or no interest. Mm -hmm. But the the, de the loan would not be re or debt would not be repaid until the harvest came mm -hmm. in. Yeah, yeah. I <coughs> my son-in-law's uncle always said, "A gift is better than a loan, and it costs about the same." Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, um, there's a uh, there's a video that I that I came across uh, while I was editing the show. It just kind of came in from outer space uh, that I think is is so wonderful. Uh, it isn't about debt per se, but I thought it was fitting at this partic particular juncture. Uh, there was a Russian singer whose name is Bulat, uh, excuse me, Bulat, Bulat Okuchava, 
and he was actually from Georgia. He, uh, he's not actually Russian. He was uh, a so from the Soviet Union. Yes. And so this is a song that he sings uh, called The Prayer. He's singing it in, in uh, his native language. And I was able to find a really nice poetic uh, translation of the song. And so I put up some, some nice, easy to read subtitles. And so I'd like to, to go ahead and, and go into Roland number six, if we could please. Пока земля еще не пока еще ярый свет, Господи, дай же ты каждому, чего его нет. think that's a wonderful <laughs> song. <laughs> it's just so great. It, it sounds like it might be a real prayer or it may not at all be a real prayer. You know, when you when you really look at the words. Okay, so um, any final thoughts on, on our, their, our issue of debt and jubilee and... Give a little to everyone. Don't forget about me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I like the idea of jubilee. Mm -hmm. I think ultimately that's what you're going to have to do, just cancel the debt. Especially places like Africa, Greece. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if the debt was in, were 
is incurred by fraud, like, you know, much of our mm -hmm. national debt. Right. You know, who do we owe it to? You know, swindlers. Swindlers, yeah. Okay, well, it looks like we have about two minutes two to minutes. go, okay. by the way. I think we're, we should be looking more at the, the disparity between those who have the haves and the have-nots. We should do a show on that. And I think we should do a show on that, yes. Okay, next show. Uh, okay, but what I'm what I'm saying is, the people who have the power and have the money Are the own the debt. Yeah, mm -hmm. own the debt. Yes, and, ul point. and ultimately that debt is a way to control us. Yeah, too much money's done yeah. falling into too few hands. I don't think they think of it that way. Mm. But I, do, but I do think oh, that's, I do believe that's that. the I think effect. They do. <laughs> you think so? Yes. I think they do. I really do. We okay. we are we have a hard bitten lot at this table. I yes. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I want to thank thank everyone uh, for for being here to, to talk about this this uh, this topic, and thank you, John, for for your music. Thank you. Yeah. And thank Inviting you for for having watched the show. Mm -hmm. And so uh, next up is going to be dessert. What I call dessert. It's going to be international cartoon time. And so I, uh, every week I put, or every show, I put together a bunch of cartoons to give us an idea of what's going on in the world and also to give, give us an idea of what the world thinks is going on here. And for the control room, the last uh, 60 seconds of the cartoon time is, is uh, reserved for Roland. So it's just black with music. And we got the thumbs up on that. So here we go. International cartoon time, enjoy. Okay, here's this one just kills me. It's this guy being led away in handcuffs by cops who are upside down to go to some place where everybody else is upside down and he's the only one that's right side up. <laughs> hmm. This one here was from a Scottish uh, newspaper apparently and it shows a worm crawling through an apple and it says uh, cuts and cock-ups and uh, I think that the face there is supposed to be a guy who's responsible for educational slashing education in Scotland. This one from Australia uh, shows climate change and shows people fighting over in the Middle East while the real bomb is climate change. Oblivious of the real. So true. So true. The so true. The real danger. Mm -hmm. This one from Romania. Uh, it shows Hamas and Israel both running and running, trying to shake hands, but they're all on treadmills that are going the other way. The opposite. <laughs> true. Yeah. <laughs> so true. And in yeah. between them is a chasm <laughs> with vultures. This one from Jordan, I think, is just great. It shows uh, the guy who's uh, the current uh, uh, president or premier or whatever of, of Egypt um, and his bloody... Uh, or his, his, his power grab and, and all the protests there. This one from Croatia is showing uh, uh, Germany's Merkel riding a Grecian column down a slope. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to say, How true. keep her foot How true. So How true. we need to pay attention to this, yes. what's going on in Europe. Slippery we're, slope. We're next. Yes. This one from France is showing um, uh, that Palestine, Palestine now has a baby chair <laughs> at the UN, and you know is is UN in in France. Oh, that's because they mm -hmm. recognition. Stems. Yeah, yeah, they got some recognition. This one from Mexico. The guy on the left is uh, is the uh, some mild mannered guy who has been elected uh, in Mexico, and and he is kind of tied by a sash to this uh, this monster, and his feet are kind of like monster feet, also. This one from Panama is showing, uh, showing uh, it looks like uh, um, Hamas and some other being, and they're, they're uh, toasting over this roasting bomb. <laughs> kind of curious. Uh, this one is from Holland, and it says uh, a, a court uh, order has uh, decreed that tobacco company uh, executives have to admit that they knowingly misled uh, uh, customers um, 
when they knew that their product was harmful. This is a beautiful one from mm. Holland, I believe, and it shows the Statue of Liberty all patched and tattered, holding up this, this torch of freedom, and it says Obama on there. And so the, the, the Europeans still have some hope for us <laughs> and who we have elected. And uh -huh. this one is from Holland, and it shows Bush rowing away from a sinking dollar, and then it shows Romney motoring away, away from, from a sinking, sinking dollar. <laughs> On his yacht, no less. <laughs> On his, lot, his yacht, exactly. Uh. This one from Cuba showing uh, some kind of like a prisonish thing with no on the window and an arm coming out that says yes. This is from Ari's, uh, the great cartoonist who I just think is so wonderful. Bradley Manning? Uh, I don't think it's that. I think it's probably more general than mm -hmm. that. But uh, he's an example of that. Another upside down. Yeah, right. Talking with your feet. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is also <laughs> from Ari's. He has a very capricious sense of humor. This one, again from Ari's, showing some kind of a luxury car uh, hurtling off into some abyss. Is that the fiscal cliff? It could be the fiscal cliff. Could be, I don't know. And this one from Cuba, showing a priest with a, a devil um, and a hula hoop atop his head. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, apparently Aries isn't convinced of the sanct the uh, the uh, s sacredness of priests. And this, I believe, is our last cartoon, also by Aries, an award-winning cartoon that shows a man playing what looks like it ought to be a violin, but it's actually a barcode. <laughs> Consumerism. <laughs> Aye. Aye. Who knows? Okay. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. Two weeks.